reciting the big declaration all of the parents in the set. So, and we can indeed say that the Nietzschean declaration doesn't have so much the structure of the declaration of the event as indeed the structure of declaration of declaration. But my point will be now and also in some further lectures precisely to show how this duality is not simply a tautology or how this tautological circular movement does in fact produce something essential which is precisely the real in the Nietzschean sense of the term. So, so the first point to make in relation to this declaration of declaration is perhaps that we are not here simply in the domain of the potentially endless reflection of sentences, representations of representations of representations of infinity, that we lack any tangible, real, in, and merely reflect and on the contrary, the duality of doubling the here, dealing here in the declaration, declaration is a very, as I said, precise in the articulation of the will. And before linking this more directly to this figure of the two, the specific figure of the two, um, I would also like to make one more reference or comparison to in the art, maybe the, I think there is a kind of resemblance or structural uh, affinity between, between the Nietzschean declaration um, and what is known as, let's say, uh, the structure of avant-garde manifestos. I mean, if you think of it, what is a manifesto? And about all, what is a manifesto in relation, for instance, precisely to the art to which it belongs? It is not a theory of art or a conceptual rendering of certain artistic product. It is, or one could say, an artistic act, act itself. And one can, cannot easily separate or oppose the art and its manifesto, but at the same time, they don't kind of reflect each other. So without simply consigning, they are bound together in an inherent and essential way. Uh, and perhaps one could say that uh, the relationship uh, is precisely that the, the manifesto is a kind of a speech act of the art itself. As one can say it. And as you also uh, remember or know, manifestos constitute and introduce a very singular point of enunciation. In them, it is almost always the case that art speaks in the first person. It's like the formula of enunciation is something like I, the new art, am speaking. The manifesto usually doesn't declare that this or that happened in art and the art will never again be the same. And this is an event, this is not really how the declaration of manifestos is formulated. It says something of I or we, the group, happen, are happening, will happen. Uh, but however, this I involved in this declaration is not, of course, simply I don't know, the, the ego of the artist. <coughs> it is the declaration uh, precisely of an impersonal, inhuman art. So that what appears as a megalomanic aspect of most manifestos should in no way be read as a shameless, subjective arrogance on the part of the artists themselves as individuals. And yet, to uh, return to previous discussion, this, not do, this does not mean that these statements are made ironically. This is not, not this kind of thing. They are subversive precisely because they are meant most seriously. At the bottom, we could say that irony is an assertion very often precisely of the ego and of its often spiteful supremacy, which kind of reaffirms itself as the one who sees things more clearly. And as you know, most avant-garde manifestos go to great lengths to abolish precisely the notion of the artist as the ego who makes art. They do not accomplish this by means of irony, but precisely by substituting the subject work in place of the ego. So the subjectivity that so vehemently affirms itself in manifestos, manifestos 
is the art object itself somehow. And uh, this megalomania or its effect is strictly correlative to the withdrawal of the ego. This is very often in the that the two movements are go together. So, but could we say that the declaration in which art is declaring itself in the form of a manifesto simply lacks doing? I think one would be hard pressed to answer in the affirmative. The point is rather that the declaration is part precisely of the will that it declares. This is why it can not declare the event as if speaking from the outside, but rather takes the form of I, the event, in speaking. There is this kind of almost, uh, again, uh, common truth. And I think something very similar could be said into, uh, concerning the relationship between Nietzschean declaration and Nietzschean event. The event is referent to declaration. And if, as seen uh, by you, in first from there, the declaration is lacking the real or its object, that it is caught in the impossibility of distinguishing between the presence and the announcement of the event, this is perhaps not the only way to see it. I could also say that this impossibility is the very presence of the will, the very indication of the will at work in this book. And not that it is uh, not a relation to the will, it is not a relation to the will, but we could even say a relation of the will. It, some kind of a real difficulty opens up here in that. In that. So for Nietzsche, the will is not something that could be merely declared. And yes, this is not because the declaration lacks the will, but because it is in se itself somehow always contaminated by it. I think would be that's the best way to put it in relationship to Nietzsche. Because it belongs to it. And I think if you take the uh, example of the event love, which is also one of the, the, uh, the teams dear to you, but if you take the example of the event love, an encounter that makes us fall in love and in this process declare our amorous state. You could ask the same question, what is the real thing? So, uh, 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 where is, it? is it something simply that happened in this encounter and that we now have to declare as such when we declare this love? I would say that not exactly. The, the, the real here is the very ground somehow in which we stand when declaring it. And this is what redoubles the declaration of love at its core. This is what makes a declaration of love, as well as perhaps any declaration of the event, as something that is always a precipitated statement. It involves a leap in causality, not only in relation to a pre-existing situation which it interrupts, but also in regard to its own beginning, or its own beginning. A declaration of love is an excellent example of those, I think, precipitated statements which literally uh, create the conditions of their own enunciation. What I mean is that we, when we declare it, it is as if the effort that will only take place with this declaration already exists. We stand that we kind of count on this effect when we declare count on. We already include it as the point of enunciation from which we make this so in this kind of uh, precipitated statement that create the conditions of their own initiation and with them the conditions somehow also retrospectively of the very will that they declare. So that again, we have this kind of a quasi uh, circular structure that at the same time essential for the real as such to take place. Even though we can say now it is too very Roughly metaphorically, that there is, of course, some kind of a not real outside, but something that is in no way reducible to the statement or to the declaration, and to a certain degree independent of it. It is nevertheless something that only takes place also with this declaration, not simply because of the our fidelity that is manifested through this declaration, but also with something of the real itself 
is created or be possible in this uh, situation itself. Yes. <coughs> Or there is this kind of a retrospective logic. I think logic in a state order we hear that the uh, also I see the <coughs> took place even before it took place or something that, that, that there is a kind of a strange particular temporality involved in the will if we relate this will to the notion of the of the event. And this is of course a kind of combination of the you and the thing and each and notion of so I won't go now into this anymore because it doesn't really uh, concern the topics of this uh, uh, today. So I, I simply say this to say that Nietzsche, what is at stake in Nietzsche's conception of the event uh, is not, I think, a conceptual decision to dismiss any notion, I don't know, of the real in order to replace it with the notion of multitude of presentations that only reflect one another and so on. But simply, or more importantly, what is at stake is a new and also different conceptualization of the real itself. It's not its dismissal, it is a, an attempt to uh, conceptualize it in a, in a new way. Um, and in a way, precisely, that is not simply, that there must be does not posit the real something simply as something beyond the work of representations and declarations, but neither does it uh, articulate it as something that is simply reduced to them, reducible to them. And now I will simply come to the point which will then kind of constitute the, uh, the thread of, which constitutes the thread of my reading of Nietzsche, namely that Precisely, there exists something beyond, something else besides the couple formed by, on the one hand, the classical or metaphysical position which exempts the real from the speech, let's say, positive in the former as material basis or touchstone of the latter, and on the other hand, the so called ever sophistic position which tries to undermine the very notion of the real, claiming, let's say, that speech is all, that the real does not exist. That all comes down to the question of whatever conventions, different language games, different perspectives and interpretations. So, my bet here in this reading of Nietzsche is precisely that he also, for Nietzsche, there exists something third or whatever else beyond, the, the kind, uh, besides, sorry, this um, alternative. And furthermore, that this something else exists uh, as precisely as a specific reality or a specific notion or articulation of a truth, a reality having nothing to do with the dichotomies, of course, between whatever complementary or positional terms. And it's also a reality that is not yet a multiplicity. It's not already, let's say, accountable to it. I will can, uh, for this, who already know the, the book uh, very thoroughly, it will be perhaps interesting in some later point, I will um, present some work that I did on this notion of the two format, also for, uh, during the public lecture, I, I, I thought of this. Um, it's a kind of a, a attempt to um, s further articulate and specify this notion of the two that I'm producing, uh, that, that I'm trying to articulate, which is which could be defined precisely as an uncountable two. It is more it is more than one, but not a two. It is not like it is as if one no longer counts as one, but at the same time it is not two that we can group and say, okay, we already have two, this is the beginning of a multiplicity. Uh, I think I, I found via some other author another ways of perhaps making this notion more palpable and uh, as I say we will is it, is it different from the idea of formulation of uh, the one that count or two account? I mean, would you say a bigger the two is the same as bad views? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think, I think there are some, uh, it definitely uh, inspired me a lot with this review paper. This is clear, uh, the even in front of two, and to a certain extent, yes, but there are two, I think, I mean, the one major difference is, of course, that he, he presents this as exclusively Proper to the procedure of life. I mean, for, for him, there is no other. This is something that the, the uh, generic procedure of love invents as its own figure of uh, fidelity or articulation of the, of the event and its implications. 
and uh, where what I try to do here and uh, ever is to, to show that this structure is not or it's perhaps also slightly different uh, than the one that he um, articulates, but also that is not limited to the uh, to the generic procedure of, of love, but could be taught also in other um, articulated and taught in other uh, domains of uh, practices and so on. So it's not. There is a link. I will still have to think about how to uh, define the relationship between the two precisely, but perhaps it is to become more clear as we go along. But definitely there is a link, uh, but also uh, uh, a certain difference, I would say. But the, as a, the starting point, which is a kind of immanent count for two, is basically the same. I would say that it, it starts at the same uh, level of uh, reflection, but then. Uh, a few differences appear, perhaps to I develop it further in some in some other field. So I don't know. There are, there are of course uh, several ways now in this first more perhaps even too metaphorical way of approaching this kind of a uh, kind of a question. Then perhaps becomes highly conceptual, but we can, one way of thinking of this reality is precisely in terms of what is an edge, what does, what does an edge, uh, how the edge uh, articulates a tool. Uh, it is something that, uh, that exists as simultaneously linking and separating, let's say, two surfaces. Uh, it is specific duality, and this duality makes the uh, aims in my reading precisely at this real and makes it take place to the very split that gives structure to this duality. This duality is always in each act something that uh, uh, is related to one becoming two. So this is perhaps also slightly different starting point from the from the Badius. It is kind of introduce, uh, it makes a seal, introduces a it introduces reality an original split of reality in the very existence of a one or something like this. It's such a difference uh, from a different point of view, from a different perspective. So perhaps one another example, I'm still in the discussion of approaching the what could be uh, um, what modus of articulation could be at work here. Um, to think of this two or this reality is also to think of it. Um, to take an example of the mouse trap in Shakespeare's Hamlet, for instance. I think this is a good example because we have, okay, we have a play within the play. So this play within which they uh, stage the, the murder of Gonzago. Uh, so on, on the first side, we have this logic of simply redoubling a representation, play within the play. But precisely, as it is clear, I think, to everybody, uh, it is this play within the play in Hamlet does not have the same structure of logic or impact as it would have, for instance, a play within the play within the play within the play. It, it needs to stop there. It's not uh, too much to this here in order for this will to take place. And to this example, I will also return to some of the subsequent lectures perhaps more in detail. But the case here is that two are enough. Uh, and further multiplication or mirroring would clearly lead to an entirely different configuration. I don't say, say that this would be without any interest, but this is not the case here. It is not the beginning of an endless metonymical illusion, but at the same time, we need this redoubling for the very will of what took place to be articulated within the play. So in Hamlet, we have this uh, example where the redoubling of, of fiction far from avoiding or lacking the real functions as the very trap or mouse trap, as we put it, of the real. One could say that the mouse trap in Hamlet has exactly the status of declaration of declaration. Through the staging of this murder of Gonzago, Hamlet declares what was declared to him by his father's ghost, and yet something happens here that um, produces the effect of the real. And also, which I think it's related to what 
which we mentioned before, this declaration of declaration taking the form of a stage performance here succeeds precisely because it produces a dimension of I, the real, am speaking. It is clear that for, for, for the king it is as if the real itself has spoken. A kind of knowledge of the real that gets to the foreground uh, within the structure of this play. And this is, of course, also what throws the murderous king out of balance and then he sees that, that he goes, cries out his famous cry, give me some light. Which he betrays this. Okay, so Nietzsche often is often prized, as you know, for his precise insistence on multiplicity against the ontology of the one. Uh, and yet, I here I want to what we discussed during the pause a bit. Uh, I think that Nietzsche's real invention is not so much a multiplicity, but precisely a certain figure of the two. And this is the figure that we will. Try to follow. The logic of the two implies also a specific temporal structure, a kind of time loop that introduces a singular temporality into the Nietzsche notion of the truth as well. So for Nietzsche, truth is bound up with a certain notion of temporality. It is instead of being uh, uh, a But this temporality is not the one that we usually oppose to eternal truth. So the fact that the truth has a temporality does not simply mean that truths are uh, transition children of their time, that they are related to whatever uh, moment they took place. It means, or what I would like to get to, is some other dimension of time. It means that at the very core, the truth, the structure of truth, involves uh, some temporal dimension or a kind of a temporal paradox in which the truth only becomes what it is, to use the Nietzsche's phrase. And this temporal mode of truth is that it's existing as its own antecedent. And we can, I can also give you an example of a phrase from Lacan, which I think comes very close to this when he says, the truth in this sense is that which runs after truth. So there is this kind of idea also present. This is from the whole fundamental concept of psychoanalysis. So the temporal mode of, of antecedence is correlative to the temporal mode of the notion also of the subject uh, who is and caught up, caught in a loop wherein the subject will have to appear at the point of the will, which inaugurated her or him in some other time. This is a kind of a, a structure that uh, was already mentioned. Or to put it slightly differently, the subject will have to appear at the point of the will where she is inaugurated as if from elsewhere. And we find um, several uh, formulations of this of this time loop in Nietzsche himself, of course, this constitution of subjectivity. For instance, when, uh, when the voiceless voice says to Zarathustra, you, you shall go as a shadow of that which must come. We have the, the, the same reversal of the shadow comes first and then only is possible for the, the, the thing itself. So the, this is one uh, form or one line of the articulation of the two that we find in Nietzsche. There is also another line, one which is perhaps even more explicit uh, and that, that is ex uh, extremely present in, for instance, the Ipsa Formo, in the, the, the preface especially, uh, where Nietzsche starts with the question again, who am I? And the answer is, uh, I am, I quote, a decadent and a beginning. I, I know both, I am both. So this is another line of Nietzsche's statement in which he keeps declaring that he is two things. He's been a double being, he says, I'm a double. Um, and I'm the sorry. Can I, the first yeah. part of that quote, I'm a what and a beginning? I'm a... Uh, 
Decadent, decadent. 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 Okay. And uh, beginning. Yeah. Thank you. I know both. I am both. Uh, and this uh, is behind Doppel again. There is actually the alternative version of this, uh, the same paragraph. And then uh, this insistence is very uh, important all throughout the, the group. Uh, I am too, I am spirit, I am the event. Nietzsche keeps repeating also, uh, I am uh, Dionysus and the crucified, you know, the very position that he made between them. I am both at the same time, I am the edge between the two and so on. Um, and again, here we have this idea that uh, this edge is, or this duplicity or these two, is what Nietzsche will ultimately hold to be his invention or creation. Because he can say precisely that up till then there was Dionysus and there was the crucified. They existed together with everything that these names connote or name in Nietzsche's philosophy as well as outside it. And also we could say that the word broken in two is broken along the fourth line of what these two names mark. But at the same time, and this is what Nietzsche considers as his achievement, they only emerge as two, as a double and strong within this very break which takes place with and because of Nietzsche's declaring. So in a certain sense, Nietzsche will transform the two lines into a twofold face, which is his image also of the break. Merged or combined as the shortest distance between the two names and what they know. And the shortest distance between the two is precisely the edge, of course. It's not kind of a uh, common ground. As we shall see later on, this edge is also the only possible location of what is designed as beyond good and evil, which again is not a realm beyond, but precisely has this structure of, a, of an edge. That we can, it's not so easy to walk on as it is in some beyond it's not a realm. And in this line, we could also say that the event Nietzsche is precisely this edge. Uh, so so if, yeah, can you just uh, say that again? If, if not a realm, it's an edge. Yeah, what I mean is, for instance, if you uh, take all this, this is a good example, it's precisely this beyond good and evil. The, the, the word beyond usually implies a realm beyond the two realms that are referred to in the statement. Uh, beyond good and beyond, or, the, or, or, or simply the image that beyond a field or a discourse structured by the, this couple of good and evil, there is a beyond. There is a realm as a kind of a, there are field that we can enter and uh, remain within, let's say. And I think that a very important point to make in relation to Nietzsche, because this beyond is quite recurring uh, phrase also in this philosophy is precisely that this is not simply some kind of a realm or a field that we step in once we go beyond good and evil, but that is uh, at the same time the very uh, point uh, or edge between the two, which into which kind of changes the very landscape of the good and evil here, so, that, so to say that this uh, a pair no longer is no longer operative in the same way, in the way of structuring precisely the, our reality that is uh, uh, supposedly <coughs> lost in the position, but we kind of reach it here and now. It's not somewhere beyond it. I think this is also uh, a very important point that uh, um, the view all the debates in relation to Nietzsche, and perhaps also in relation to the rest, that this beyond is precisely um, something that. Uh, uh, it's already here. It's not some, simply something that will happen once or that will uh, or that uh, implies some kind of a different domain, but it's something that is to be detected and created uh, in, in the very field from which we are speaking, but will also uh, hopefully or expectantly change it profoundly. But I will return to this point. I think I hope I didn't throw this out uh, also uh, in different terms. So 
if we, if Nietzsche is kind of a, the right, it's not the right measure of Dionysus is crucified, if, if he is the right measure, it's not in the sense of a happy medium or a golden mean in which everything is reduced to, to the balance of a place of equilibrium, but rather in the sense of a linking or holding that maintains the two things together somehow at their extreme point, at the extreme point of their precisely incommensurability, at the point where they can only just be perceived as two uh, that are distinguished yet in the indistinguishable. And I think this is also what we have to keep in mind when reading passages as this one, which is quite uh, famous from uh, one of the often quoted religious places, when he says, we immoralists, this world which concerns us, in which we are called upon to fear and to love, this nearly invisible, inaudible world, not quite world in every respect, uh, this passage, I think this passage is not quite or nearly which is uh, substantializes by nigh to us, by nigh here, is not here to indicate something approximate. It is a signifier precisely of something that continually reiterates itself with a very specific, within a very specific sense in Nietzsche's philosophy. This not quite is precisely the minimal difference between two things, or the same thing also we could say. The exact measure or the shortest shadow between two things. It is the very articulation of doubleness or the figure of the two. And we will encounter this also in the form of the precise of this famous expression, shortest shadow by which Nietzsche characterizes midday or noon. And I think that the same, somehow the same logic is at work also in Nietzsche's notion of life. That this could perhaps make things even more palpable. And that which, in a decadent way, turns against life, let's say the ascetic ideal, we speak about this more in the after now, it is self something that springs from life, of course, it does not spring from somewhere else. And so this is the first premise, the premise of Levin, so to say. But from there uh, onwards, the opposition of life and death, the tension between them, becomes the very definition of life somehow. Life is two things. It is life and it is death. It is, so to say, the living edge between them. So death, in the emphatic sense of the word, is also that of this edge, precisely. The end of this tension, the fall into simply one or the other which is for Nietzsche, of course, always the fall into one, for a certain, in a certain sense. Um, so I think to kind of briefly uh, recapitulate uh, what I was saying so far, the Nietzschean event could be captured by the declaration uh, which he makes in the, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, when the eyes would to try, one became two. I think this, is, this could be put as a kind of a, um, epithet of what we'll be trying to uh, explore in different directions here. So we could say that the exact formula of Nietzsche's declaration is not even I am the event, nor I will break the world in two, or I am dying, but rather something like I am two, or Nietzsche is two, or this is all the one is already become. So I don't know, I, I have here the whole discussion of uh, this temporal loop of subjectivity that, ha that comes to a certain place that is kind of precipitately uh, declared in advance of the um, notion, very important notion of Augenblick in Nietzsche, and I discuss it in relation to uh, uh, to a short movie that you perhaps film that you perhaps know, some of you surely, uh, Chris Marker's La Jete, and the way that the whole structure which was kind of remade, and the more famous perhaps uh, mm -hmm. 
the army of He kind of, I mean, it's very different thing, but uh, it's purely inspired to me. So I, I have this whole discussion here, but I don't think I should even try to uh, venture into this when we only have 20 minutes uh, left. And so perhaps I will just make one point, if it will make any sense without this uh, preambula in relation to the album Britons and Or else I can simply decide to continue here and to cut, I mean, this, uh, I wasn't sure how much time I will uh, need to go to this today, so what I prepared for today is much too long, I'm afraid. So either we simply go on, and then I cut up some other stuff for maybe take a this is the best way to do it, and or else, if you, you can also read this in the book, I, I don't know what exactly, and I shorten this part today and we start with something else tomorrow. I think yeah, it could be the topic is the death of the dark man less than this, but isn't that uh, super important? Really? Which one? Yeah, what, what the part where uh, the temporal uh, Yeah, it is very important, of course it's like, uh, Uh, you know where perhaps yeah, yeah. just approximately is. If you do uh, take this from the book and then if you find some time perhaps to read it uh, tomorrow, it's not so long, it's like 20 pages. Perhaps, uh, and we can perhaps start tomorrow by briefly discussing this if you have any questions in relation to this. And also if you have any questions, uh, I mean, if there is a large interest, I was speaking with Ryan before, uh, some of you surely so this movie, it's really worth seeing regardless of what, what I'm making of it, which is not so much, but it's a kind of a absolute masterpiece. So perhaps if we might find at some point, or if we get too tired of just talking, we can take half an hour with some of the mm -hmm. following pictures and take a look at this. It's worth seeing if you don't mind. But in, in this sense, I think this is really a good idea now to perhaps I will just stop here and we have like 15 minutes of discussion left. And uh, then tomorrow, before uh, going on, engaging on some other stuff, we can uh, discuss this part. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, just as a practical matter, um, last year we, we watched a movie in the evening after the lecture, so if those, uh -huh. unless you're interested, after the evening lecture, we can actually watch the whole movie as a group for those who are interested. Or, or, or even yeah, of course, I mean, it's only half an hour and in any case, it's not yeah. a long uh, movie, it's a kind of photo novel, it's not a movie, it's, but it's a really, the very structure, it's a, to me, one of the best things uh, ever made, to, as I said, regardless of, uh, of this, uh, what I made of it, which is simply very, something very specific, but uh, yeah, if there is a possibility that you can organize, I can simply uh, mention the, the, this and mm -hmm. you can see or, it some other yeah. time. Or maybe even on our Twitter that Sunday or we yeah. 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 we'll, we'll figure something out. Yeah, but it's, it's a short thing. It's not that you don't need to, to come to the full time. Yes, of course. When the, like with life and death come together at the edge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you said that it, it, because there's not another realm that exists on that, that it changes? They change life and death in that moment on the edge? Yeah. It, they change also, okay, the first thing that changes is precisely um, not only our perception of them, but also, and following from there, the way we are in life. Because if it's not, if we don't simply oppose life to death and try strive to get rid of all the moments, let's say, of deadness in life, in this sense of trying to separate them and uh, put them in some realm that will take place uh, some sense beyond life, but if we uh, uh, kind of can account for these inherent contradictions of life in this sense, then this effectively changes life and death as we live it or as we die. It is uh, possible to say this. So there is the idea is, of course, that 
if we no longer simply, I mean, it's a very simple idea, if simply we don't no longer perceive as life as simply opposed to that. You have this notion, of course, amply and perhaps much more exemplarily uh, at work already in Freud, and especially in Lacan and his elaboration of the dead drive uh, in Freud, which has precisely this idea that dead drive is not some kind of a uh, ob ob obscure will in us that wants to die, but it's simply something in, in life that uh, insists on something beyond life, as and beyond the, uh, the limits of life. It's to say, jouissance or enjoyment is Lacan's uh, classic example, which means that if you really, let's say, want something or something drives you be beyond what is called the pleasure principle, beyond the consideration of direct well, your well-being. If you do something crazy, even though you might know that it's crazy, but you cannot keep yourself from doing it. So it could be dangerous, but this does not mean that this, and this is what, let's say, is what kind of refers to as a dead drive. And it does not mean that we aim at something, we aim at the dead, but we simply want something here in this life, regardless if this uh, finally kills us. Put it very, very, very deeply. So it's not something that wants to die. It is something that doesn't give a damn whether we live or die. But it just wants this thing, and this thing, of course, is part of life and is part of being alive too, and desire for this thing. This thing. So there is a kind of it's a similar notion of uh, life and death being uh, like a strange short circuit be between life and death that is the very drive of life. So to say. Because for, for Lacan, this opposition that is still, to a certain extent, maintained in Freud between dead drives and uh, life drives or uh, uh, erotic drives, uh, he dismisses it as irrelevant. He sees that there is only one drive, and this is dead drive. But precisely in the sense that I tried to uh, extract before, this is to say that it is something that is neither life or death, but the very so short circuit between them, that is the driving force of everything that is uh, also of interest in life, not only that can uh, have uh, some other also disastrous consequences, but it is not something that we can um, cut into and separate simply between life and death. It is essential to life, but at the same time, it is not life in the sense of preservation. Okay, we can also put it this way. It's, uh, if life is defined simply in terms of preservation of life, then that drive doesn't enter this picture. It enters is precisely there when this preservation of life is somehow, could be somehow neglected uh, in order to be alive at all. I mean, it's not something that uh, 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 denies life or says no to life, but precisely something that can only affirm it if it at some point doesn't give a damn whether it's right or not. Yeah, it, it could be, I mean, this is addictions, okay, there, there are another, another story, but uh, it is, uh, yeah, the structure uh, kind of uh, <laughs> reminds us, but it's, let's say, okay, it's not simply, the, the problem with the heroin addiction, at least, I think it's my mostly, uh, perhaps, very um, narrow way of seeing it, uh, but it is uh, here, some, very strangely, uh, it is really, really um, self-centered in the sense that it's not that we are out to do something even if it kills us. It is simply we have to get even more pleasure in equilibrium even if it kills us. It's something that, uh, that is on, on the subjective level, it is not even experienced as beyond the pleasure principle. I mean, this is very offhand uh, reply, but it's yeah. to be in pleasure all the time we need, yeah, we need to accept that it can kill us. But at some point, it is uh, strangely remains within the pleasure principle with this addition that it needs, of course, this uh, substance, whatever, to, uh, which is dangerous in itself to remain. But it, that it has a slightly different structure, I would say, that from most of all. What could be interesting for uh, living in this uh, um, affirmative life in this sense. Yeah. There's a construction of individuality, perhaps um, arriving or emanating from the two, meaning that you, you say that you, you, you are what you 
become, right? Uh, you become what you are. You become what you are, which is the sort of yeah, yeah. time, right? Uh, can you and and I, I was wondering if perhaps you appropriate that becoming in your being, if that makes sense. Uh, so that so that your very individuality is based on the edge or a difference at which, um, which perhaps perhaps makes us uh, come back to the singular universality, mm -hmm. where you are in fact um, individuality, individuality as a difference or as an edge. But I don't know if you if you like the word yeah. individuality, but yeah, it's it's a different word. I, I, yeah. I don't usually use it. Uh, this is actually this is precisely the, the the part that I skipped now and that you will uh, hopefully be able to, to read uh, for tomorrow. I mean the, this circularity. I, I come back precisely to this question of uh, how one how does one become what one is? What what does it mean exactly? Especially considering that one only is what one becomes at the same time. It's not at all that. We, uh, it, the idea is not that there is some kind of a not fully developed germ of our individuality that then needs to be fully developed and then when one fully develops it, one becomes what one is. It is really that this circularity, and this is also why I use this movie because it's precisely in this idea, you can never, actually it's pointless even to ask what comes first. It is a kind of a, a circular structure but with, with a minimal difference uh, which uh, accounts for this difference precisely between what I am and what I become, uh, which is essential, but it not in the way that we can say first I was there or wasn't there and then this happened and I became what I was. And sometimes, you know, this is related to in certain discourses to some kind of whatever empathic experiences or ordeals that then bring us to our truth. Here I think in Nietzsche and especially uh, in as a philosophy of a more uh, Lacanian inspiration that I like to follow, it is precisely uh, this germ only, uh, uh, only emerges through what we do in life to a certain extent, uh, what, what happens here. It's not at all that it exists somewhere before. It kind of, a, but the presu I see the very presupposition of this strange object that we then become needs to be there in order for the whole thing to function uh, at all. And in this sense, yeah, perhaps we could, uh, if, uh, I don't know if I understood your question rightly, that this affects the very question of being as such or our being as individuals. I didn't. Uh, um, it's interesting in the being as individuals or the constructions, the construction of individuality as, as based on the edge or based on mm -hmm. the break. Mm -hmm. And that's in some sense, but uh, perhaps that's, that's uh, futile, but to, 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 to see the construction of individuality as the very appropriation of the double. Mm -hmm. So that so that you have the difference that uh, yeah individuality, individuality based on difference and as that is a paradox I, I thought about the singular universality um, as uh, as again the ironic aspect coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, I would I think it, it, these two things are definitely uh, related. Perhaps the the formulation with, he, with which I have slight problems and it's probably because I don't exactly know what you mean is this construction of individuality because this means again that we are I'm, I'm not for this kind of idea that you know as if we can uh, in kind of first perhaps Foucauldian aesthetic of existence construct ourselves as individuals that there is this kind of yeah ironic structure that kind of construct with itself this is not what I had in mind it's a, it's a different uh, logic of uh, Engagement or also of becoming of mm -hmm. which is not exactly a construction. I just wanted to, to ask if it's possible to comment because with, with, with you, you spoke about the mechanism of irony and of, of, of becoming, but also in, also in the other side of psychoanalytic, Lacan speaks at length about ontology with the mate and, and shame as a. Mm -hmm. as a as a, the, the fact that deserves that in a way, insofar as the, as the signifier doesn't represent the subject fully, mm -hmm. but but not in the sense that it, it's it's between the matter signifier and a, the S two the, the matter signifier, but there is an excess in that sense. With, with, uh, so I just wanted to know if you think that, especially because in the chapter where he introduces this, is really there's really kind of Nietzschean tone. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. he speaks about. It's not uh, shame is the only concept 
where you can have the, you can actually find the genealogy of it. Mm -hmm. So it's also something we should mm -hmm. talk about much with genealogy. We need to know uh, if you think that uh, in so far as uh, in Nietzsche ontology, the, 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 the struggle, the power struggle is already it's on, on, it's a matter of ontology. It's in an ontological mm -hmm. level. I, isn't he properly an ontological philosopher with an age? Nietzsche. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, uh, thank you for this question because uh, definitely I think this uh, question of shame and the, this strange, especially last uh, conference of Lacan's and this seminar, I, I, which is yeah quite amazing in its precisely Nietzsche uh, tone. I think there is a very definite um, connection, and I would relate it to I think we could find in Nietzsche a point very similar to that of Lacan, uh, which is that there is a very important difference between the effect of shame and, let's say, effect of guilt. Mm -hmm. Which is a uh, guilt which implies the structure of desire and it's, it has a very different also um, capacity to be used in all kinds of, I just use the term, power games and power struggles and domination and so on. Uh, with precisely with our desire and guilt, we are, I see, already caught in advance in this machinery that is used to produce guilt and at the same time to make us feel as part of something and subjectively related to, I'd say, this or that ideological uh, um, mechanism or, or practice. And uh, of course, you know that in Nietzsche, and perhaps we will also touch just at some point, uh, he has this uh, very, very um, uh, witty and very extremely well written passages, long passages against precise against. Uh, when he makes the anatomy of the sentiment of guilt and so on. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, several passages in Nietzsche when he uses shame as something that is lacking now, precisely in the sense that uh, now everybody wants to just touch everything, nobody is ashamed. It's a very different effort, and I think that uh, Lacan's uh, theory of it is really, really very important because I, I, I would agree here that it is, I would take it to this. Even it's as if it is the very effect of the signifier. I think it's it's not some effect that it produces in this intersubjective way, but it is the very effect that accompanies the fact that the yes, subject is never mm. adequately represented by a signifier, and it, but it, it's absolutely essential. And what I find really interesting uh, um, is that I was working on this also for some paper precisely on the question of shame, and I while working on it, I came across some, uh, you know, there are all these uh, psychiatrists and psychologists that have their columns in different magazines, and I, run, I came across one of them, it was very interesting to see how now dominant ideology in uh, psychology was to clearly oppose precisely this view, but to say that shame, we should really get rid of, of shame, because this is something, that, because guilt is a very constructive concept, one who is guilty, we should then uh, there is a kind of remorse and we can walk with this kind of person. But a shame is really useless because precisely it touches, it touches the level of being. And their motto is usually, but on the level of being, we are not to be a, a ashamed of anything, you know, this kind of ideological maneuver that, yeah, sorry. So no, no, sorry, actually, yeah. just add, commenting on what you said about the difference of what you, you are working on, the notion of the two and bad view, mm -hmm. and probably this is complete extrapolation. But couldn't we maybe say that the 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 effect of Badius, subject of truth, when he uh, betrays it, would be guilt. Uh, whereas, uh, mm -hmm. you see what I mean? I mean, yeah, it, yeah, I never thought of it in these terms. Yeah, we, we wouldn't be shamed, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's not yeah. it's not a matter of an excess of, of this. You see, I don't know how to, I haven't mm -hmm. elaborated on a lot of it, but it, the subject is split. Only so far in the, in the difference between the traces of the event and the present, as he calls it in the anatomy mm -hmm. of the, in the faithful subject, but there is no access to the present. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, it, it's not as swung as Lacan develops from the, the, the after the 16th, 17th, and yeah, yeah. as swung as probably the signifier of the two, actually, uh, yeah, not yeah. as an additive thing, uh, but actually as a. Uh, so it's kind of strange because it makes you think. Uh, isn't, doesn't this make for by you the present like uh, the, the, it shouldn't have been like the present of the present like in other the others there's no access to the to the faithful subject 
yes, I, 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 I mean, like, there's, I mean, there's no split yeah, in that. It's a very, I should, but uh, if I can say something, I'm just just offhand, I think that uh, this could be a very interesting way, yeah, to pursue this difference precisely, because it is, uh, I think I, I, Lacan really, by, by in, reintroducing this concept again, as he uh, often does, against the mainstream of whatever is usually, uh, basically everybody agreed that shame is a bad concept in the sense that if you have to be whatever, free or to know whatever subject, you need to get rid of shame. And I think he reintroduces it precisely in the sense, no, if we are to be considered as free in any manual way, we need shame precisely, because this uh, ultimate attachment to the signifier is our freedom, it's not what mm -hmm. this is, it's whereas guilt precisely in this sense is something that uh, has the tendency of keeping us with, uh, within the coordinates of, and yeah, it's true that the, the question of access and the, the way, not only in re respect to love, but to any kind of fidelity, it's an interesting question, I don't know what the group would say, if it's a guilt or it's shame, but uh, Definitely, uh, I think the Lacanian way of articulating would be much more closer to the shame yeah. to the guilt here. And Nietzsche and also, I think that here, Nietzsche is very clear that he, uh, he is for this kind of uh, effort to shame. I think he, 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 his universe functions as something that can be positive in this sense, and uh, whereas guilt is not at all uh, this kind of concept. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it is time, uh, but. I know there was a few other questions, and I know these other questions as well. If we don't mind going a few extra minutes, we can take these questions or if we want to. I would ask them if it's okay. No. So in any case, I see now that this was probably, I, I, I will prefer, I mean, it's also lots of stuff are in the book anyway. So in, if now I see that I really uh, have planned wrongly, we will use this technique, as you say, that there are parts of the book that I will simply ask you to read, and if there are questions, then you can discuss them, and I will present some of them and focus perhaps uh, more or let more time for the things that I would like to add besides and so on. So there will be combination of both, but uh, yeah, so I, I guess yeah, that's it. Uh, we start tomorrow with, uh, we continue this discussion, and then from day to day I will then see how, <coughs> how, many, how much, uh, what is the proportion. I, I will try and send out that email during lunch with this portion of the book because she didn't get to. Uh, was there any floater students that did not put their name on this list? Because I have everybody else's email for the last. Anybody else needs to put their name on this?